Welcome to this episode of the Million Dollar Mastermind. I'm Larry Wydell, and let's get started. I'm here today with one of my longest term friends and colleagues in business, super successful, has made my life so rich, Senior National Sales Director, uh, Andy Young. Hello, Andrew. Good morning. Hey, how you doing, Larry? Great to have you here. For those of y'all unfamiliar with Andy, Andy started in the business straight out of Wake Forest. We have been, full disclosure, we have been, it was a great day for me, came in on July 4th, uh, back in, I believe, 1980. We've been in business together, uh, shoulder to shoulder, uh, ever since. And he's made my life so much richer. And uh, I might have taught him a thing or two along the way, but I know he's taught me a lot. Now, look, the thing about Andy, he was all set on track for a career in the NFL. Played football but uh, at Wake Forest, but... <laughs> You know, the back in the late 70s, the surgery with fixing knees, I think he had five knee surgeries, things like that, they basically did it with a chainsaw, you know, a sterile chainsaw, uh, but you basically drank half a uh, bottle of whiskey and they went in there with a chainsaw and did surgery, but it was not not really a lot of finesse, and so there, there went his NFL career, and he didn't know what he was going to do, and so, fortunately, he came our way. But, you know, one thing that Andy may talk about is patterns of success. You know, when your kids show up, you never know what's in them. But Andy showed up. He had a good, nice, good, solid family and upbringing. But he was always motivated. And Andy, right from the time he was young, he was out making money. He, was, he had initiative. He had things in his mind he wanted to do. And he had the ability to figure out how to do it. You know, you don't have to go to college to learn how to figure stuff out. He was figuring things out at a young age, accomplishing a lot. When he got into high school, he had a music uh, uh, interest as well as football. He was like the only one to reach uh, high levels in music and football. I'll let him explain that to you. But folks, there's nothing wrong with challenging kids to do something great early on. Now, you don't have to, you know, you can go overboard on that, and I think a lot of parents are. But don't think that the patterns and work ethic and the teamwork and learning how to sacrifice for goals that you're doing with your kids or your kids are doing is a bad thing. It's a great thing because by getting involved like that, they're getting mentally organized for insane success the rest of their life as if long as they know, you know they're in a position where they can pursue their dreams. And so Andy showed up. It was outstanding in high school, outstanding in college. Unfortunately, the main thing he was going for uh, was just ripped out of him. But because of that determination, he found another path. And I'll tell you from the beginning, he was no good in the beginning. This was not what he was groomed for. Uh, he was just like me, no good at this. But he knew one thing, he could get good. And he got good. And he went from getting good to getting great to becoming world class and has duplicated his success, not only long time ago getting over a million dollars in income, but he has produced a lineup of million dollar earners scattered around the country and They've continued to make millions. I mean, he has million-dollar earners that have been at that level and climbing for oh, well over a decade. And more, uh, really, more than ever on the way up the ladder right now. So he's at a, you know, he's had fabulous periods in his life, but nothing like what's happening right now. So Andy, such a privilege to have you on. Looking forward to the information about winning you're going to be able to uh, pass on. And so that's a little bit of an overview uh, from, you know, a kind of a general skeletal outline of how 
you got to where you are today. And so I'm going to let you tell people what you're most proud of and what you want to be, what what you, uh, you know, is kind of staggering to you that you've been able to accomplish. And uh, then, we, you know, we get into those principles, but they need to know who you are right now. I think one of the things, Larry, and thanks for having me, um, you know, early on, I grew up in a, in a great family, as you mentioned, and we'll talk about some of those other things as we go through, um, about, you know, the music and the football and things of those nature. But but I grew up in a family where uh, we didn't have any money. We had a lot of kids. I mean, one bathroom, seven of us, and it was always a disaster, most of them women. So um, we just like, you know, they talk about money all the time. You know, we don't have any money. Money doesn't grow on trees. And anybody that has money is going straight to hell. And so who, who wants money if that's kind of your lineup? And But I wanted some because I, I love sports and I wanted sports equipment. I wanted a nice glove for baseball. I wanted to, you know, get a new bat. Uh, I wanted, if we were playing basketball, we didn't have any place to go, you know, raise the money and, and go do those things. So I, I, it's always that, that drive inside of me, which I'll get to. But I think the biggest driving thing uh, overall and everything that I did was to be able to deliver and do things you know that made a difference in my family my mom was totally disabled when I was 14 years old and so uh, I remember flying to Palm Beach a few years ago and one of my I'm a big guy old offensive tackle and one of my buttons you can guess which button it was popped on the plane I'm sitting there in first class and people looking around and they didn't notice the button but I got up and reached into my carry-on and pulled out a sewing kit and while I was sitting there in the first class seat I sewed my button back on and a couple people looked over and says, big guy like you knows how to sew. I said, oh, yeah, my mom was disabled when I was a kid. And Shoot, I, learned, I, know I could sew, I could cook, I could do whatever you need to do. And you learn those things. But I didn't know how much time I had. And I think that's one of the things, the challenges that, that people in their life, they think they've got the people they need, especially sports teams. You know, oh, we got good players. You know, like Nick Saban won a couple uh, national championships, but he had – Hurts and he and he had two. You know, he had two All American quarterbacks, and both times one got hurt and the other one came in. You know, just interchanged. I mean, layers of players. So people always think they got the people they need, whatever it's whatever it is. I don't care if it's a team, a band, orchestra, church, whatever. So they think they got enough people, and then they think they got time, and that's another disaster. And I found out early on, I didn't know how much time I had. I didn't know at 14 years old. I didn't know how long my mom would live. She was in bed for three years for the first part of it. And finally, we got her going. But one of the big motivating factors for me was to go out there, not only to earn some money for myself to do the things that I want to do, to go to ball games and buy sports equipment, yeah, you know, just have some options, but was to be able to deliver and make her life better. And because I, you know, met Larry, you know, and, and 40 years later, as I look back on it, uh, golly, just was able to do so many things. Her brother got killed, the closest one to her, one year apart. World War II, um, she wanted to go to Hawaii, and they had a memorial out there with his name on it. And, uh, you know, when she was kind of sick and struggling, I said, Mom, we're going to go to Hawaii. You know, you got to get better. Always had things to look forward to, whether it's a trip to Hawaii, uh, going out of the country, going to baseball games, taking her to the Super Bowl. She liked that kind of stuff. But then I had to, you know, make arrangements where we get the handicap seats and all that. But that was a, early in my, in my career. That was the big thing because I really didn't know how much time I had. And the, and the kids were growing up. But, you know, they weren't at an age yet where it really made that much difference. So that was my first motivating factor and force was making sure I was in position to do something for her. And that drove me. And really, as it turned out, you know, I, I ended up having about 17 years after I got in the business to really make a difference for her and buy her a home in South Florida and just really change her life and give her the quality of life. And I would call my mom and dad. Uh, in the winter time, when they were, you know, wintering in Florida, and that was a concept we didn't grow up with. But I found out, you know, because I was able to be around people who travel and people of means. Hey, South Florida is a great place in the winter time. I talked to them, you know, I called them every day and say, "Man, we live a dream life. every single day. We live a dream life." They were so glad you worked so hard, you know, to put all this in position. Absolutely, and. Uh, uh it continued on. That was just kind of like those were like door opening experiences. But it, your whole your life has been it's all been tied together. The that you know the 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 foundation the you know the grains of sand and the clamshell that kind of irritate to try to create a pearl. All of these these motivations and, and this you know in that environment uh, combined to take the inside of that thing and turn the sand into you know pearls you know beautiful a life that is just spectacular but it it hap it takes time 
And you've got to deal with things. You've always been really good at dealing with things and getting answers and getting around getting around the right people who can give you direction or give you some clues, but also getting the people who, uh, around you who can help you. And so, uh, and, and then, you know, the theme of giving back to others, it's just a spiral of uh, accomplishment and success, but there, you never get away from the work and the challenges. And, I, you know, your, your life kind of shows that unmistakably yeah i mean it's uh early on you know to make money i didn't have we didn't have a lawnmower where i was we couldn't use a lawnmower i mean we didn't have one so i found old people and widows and uh said hey if i buy gas you know i can use your lawnmower cut the grass and a year and a half later i was like 10 years old i bought my own lawnmower my craftsman lawnmower and i was out there i was a kid in school that had green all over my tennis shoes all the time i had a newspaper route and then i got another newspaper route when I was 14, I got my work permit, so I was a dishwasher, bus boy. So working never bothered me to go get something at, you know, something at a higher level, some of the things I wanted, my goals. And I think when you're talking to people and if you're building a business, you always got to find those threads of success in the fabric of life, people that, you know, they're go-getters. They're not stay-at-home sons, 35 years old, in their mom's basement playing video games. I mean, you got to find motivated, dead-gum people. So, so that was one thing that drove me. And then mentors, you know, early on in my life, uh, music. My mom was uh, World War II broke out. She was supposed to go to Juilliard School of Music. wasn't able to go, so she was a church singer, you know. And when Billy Graham to come town, she'd organize the choirs and things like that. So I was always around music, but she made us all take piano lessons. And I started with the piano, and then I, I did. A, a, we rented a trumpet, and then um, from there. They needed a baritone player. Well, you got to be able to read the bass clef. Well, if you play piano, you read the bass on the treble clef. So I said, yeah, I'll take a shot at that. And then they needed a tuba player. So I said, yeah, I can go ahead and do that. Well, anyway, I took lessons uh, from a guy that was the first chair at the uh, United States Air Force Band, D.C. It was $15 for a half hour in the late 60s, early 70s. I mean, that's a pile of money. My mom says, you have to make the money, which didn't bother me. I went and made the money. $15 for a half hour. But I, I'm with the best guy in town. And I got to a point where we played. We were the um, feature band, 8 p.m., the last slot at the Midwest National Band and Orchestra Clinic in Chicago, which is real renowned. It's been there over 70 years. People go to it every year. It's one of the big things at that level. We had guest conductors, played grade six music, which, you know, every measure of the beat changes and goes from 3 4 to 4 4 to 2 4. And it's just tough stuff. And, and so, what I er learned at an early age is you have to embrace the repetition. I can remember preparing for that concert, and I, I got good training. Every every week I'd go, and uh, my instructor would say, if you don't work harder and practice these arpeggios and these scales, you're never going to get any good. You're going to be sorry and not be able to get all that. Okay, so you pay that guy to tell you that. Well, that's what you got to do if you want to get good at anything. And so anyway, we get up there, and uh, we probably practiced, I don't know, it might have been 500, 800 hours. I mean, for that big concert, the big 8 p.m. We're the feature band for the whole country. And um, probably five, six, seven, eight hundred hours, and we never played the concert because every single time there was a mistake, the baton would go bam, bam, bam. What are you doing back there? What's going on over here? We can't play that. You got to do this. We never played the concert through until the concert. Just like I found out later, you, you practice and practice and practice between winter workouts and spring football, and then getting ready for summer, and then two a days and three a days, uh, you know, to play a football game. And if you look this, if you look it up, it's like the Super Bowl is actually uh, 12 minutes or less long. I know it's four hours with all the commercials, but you take a football game, I mean, your offense or defense, that's six minutes, but there's a kicking game too, field goals, kickoffs, punts. So you, you don't even play six minutes in a game, but you, you prepare for thousands of hours. Same thing in the gym. So mentors have always been important. I was in a gym with uh, Manny Sistrunk, played for the Redskins. I worked out with him. And uh, interesting side note there is, when I asked him for advice, he they said he, at the time he was the strongest man in the NFL, but they didn't have the combines and all that, so I don't I don't know. But he was big and strong and a starter. But he said, hey, I'll tell you what, you can work out with me. Meet me at the track at Suitland High School at 7 in the morning, and we'll run. And I'm thinking, two linemen, what the crap are we running for? I don't want to run more than three feet away. You know, going to go run. But I was, you know, I wanted to get better, and that's what he said. He probably got rid of almost everybody that asked him for advice by saying 7 a.m. and let's go run on a track. We didn't do a whole lot of running, but, man, I got my bench press up to 350 pounds from nowhere and then ultimately over 400 pounds. But I was working out at a gym, and this is back in the days before they had juice bars and the TVs and all the luxury crap they have in, you know, all these gyms everywhere. 
Uh, this was a gym in the back, like a warehouse area, cinder blocks. And the funny thing is it was Manny Sistrunk in there. Mike and Ray Menser end up being Mr. Universe. Mitch Kupchak, you know, end up playing in the NBA after North Carolina and the general manager of the Lakers. I mean, it was, a, it was not, not more than about 50, 60 people in there, and that's kind of who was in there. Well, if you hang out with people like that, you, you have nowhere to go but up. But if you keep hanging around the same meatballs like everybody else does, you have nowhere to go but the same place or drift on down, and I refuse to do that, Larry. Absolutely. And uh, the, the thing that you carried away, the lessons from being around that, can you remember and think back the because that kind of formed the foundation moving forward. But uh, what would you say is the main takeaway that you carried from that into Wake Forest and also allowed you to carry you out of Wake Forest to when like all the doors were slammed shut in your face and everything? What did you carry forward from that uh early foundational type experiences because there was a it was almost like you were in a uh phd training program for greatness in life from the time you started those lot you know with the lawnmowers as a, as a child you know it's like you were driven to succeed to stand out you had people depending on you you know you had to fight your way out of you had to fight your way to get to the bathroom so uh <laughs> exactly <laughs> seven people and uh what was that like uh yeah four four of those were five, women? To, five to two yeah. yeah yeah exactly oh five to two yeah that so uh uh yeah not counting your uh your parents so yeah that fighting five sisters for bathroom time uh you learned how to fight early on so what did you what, what would you think you carried all, out of that and then how did that apply when you got into a little bit in college, but also, you know, in the your your business foundation. Well, the first thing was I, I don't, you know, if I'm going to play piano, I'm going to play at a it's the highest level I can, or play the trumpet or the tuba. You know, uh, if I'm going to do it, I want I want to play at a high level. I want to win, and I think it's that mindset, the winning mindset that you have to adapt. Uh, and you get to the point. I don't care if it was baseball, little league. Uh, we actually came, the team I was on, we came one game away from going to Williamsport for the Little League World Series. Um, but it's just the mindset. I, I love winning, but I hate losing way more than I love winning. I mean, early in our our career together, Larry, uh, my first year when I was terrible, you gave me a, a, a little bag of peanuts because you said that's what, you know, my, my effort and the delivery and how much money I was making. Uh, that's pretty much the, the peanuts would go feed my family. And I slammed them up against the wall in front of a bunch of people. And there were people, you know, ducking and running, hitting the floor. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this guy's got a bad attitude. I hate losing. And so I'll do I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to lose. I don't care if you and I were driving in a car and uh, it was raining. And I said, I'll bet you a dollar my raindrop on this side is going to get down before your raindrop. I don't want to lose that either. I don't want to lose anything. So that early in my, my life was just something I don't I don't know I was just hungry to if I said about doing something I want to get it done so whether it was music and then paying somebody to get to a higher level working out with Manny Sistrunk um, you know getting better in school if I didn't understand something I stayed after for when they would say hey if you can stay after and you know we'll do a tutorial session I, I volunteered to do those things I wanted to get better and so when I got to wake uh, and I had surgery. I mean, I, the first week of school was first game. So the first week of school, I missed the entire first week of school at a pretty tough academic university. And I never even thought about that for about 10 years. You and I were doing some big meeting somewhere, a seminar. And I got up and I started to tell the story. And I'm like, crap, I never I never told that story, even talked about how tough it was to go on crutches with that big cast after missing the entire first week of class in my freshman year. Because even then, it's like, I got to catch up. I got to get moving. I'm going to get beat. I don't want to get beat. I got to find a way to get moving and not make any excuses. And 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 so I, I I listen to people later on in my life that you know they make excuses for almost anything. Well, you you can't win and make excuses. So you got to find the best people to get around you. You got to understand that. So football was big to me, but music was big to me. And and I felt like if anything that I could get involved in that I believed in, which I believed in what we were doing, you know, as a business, Larry. And it's like, if I can get behind that and say, okay, this is something I'm going to do, then as you said in the beginning, I can get better. And then, once again, 
your mentorship. You know, Bob Turley, um, you know, one of our guys that was in business with us, passed on, a great guy, played for the New York Yankees. I mean, crap, people change your vision, and the vision thing is a big thing. I remember uh, Turley telling me, you know, I said, our guys want to go to an all-you-can-eat restaurant, and he said, how about Outback? And I said, but that's not all you can eat. And he said, oh, yeah, that's all you can eat. You keep ordering steaks, they'll, they'll keep bringing them. You showed me that too, Larry. We were at Long, Longhorn. You asked me if I wanted another steak one time, and I'm a big guy. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I'm dead serious. I'm like, yeah, I'll have another steak. You know, it's so, it's yeah, it's all you can eat. You got to pay the bill. And, uh, yeah, but it's all you can eat. So I, didn't, I learned that crap from you two, and you probably learned it from Turley, you know. But it's like, hey, I mean, it's a different way of thinking than the way I was raised. Uh, everything's sold out. No, it's not. You see all these movie stars and athletes sitting in the first two or three rows. If you put yourself in position and you make the money and then you make some contacts and as you go along, man, nothing's out of place. So it's, it, really, it really is true. The mentors, the books you read. And another thing, just real quick on that, like if you take today, we got our, you know, inter intergalactic technological world, but I mean, cell phones, we didn't have those in the early days. But if you take the average, you know, the top 10 people, you figure out the minutes of who you were on the phone with in the last month, probably do that pretty easy. And you take their income, add it up, divide it by 10, that's probably about what you're making. See, the bottom line is you need to add some people around you who are where you want to be if you want to be where they are. That's just the bottom line. So, yeah, one door shuts with football, but crap, I'm going to find some other way to go. And what I did was I uh, added Spanish because I was a five-year guy with a red shirt from being injured. They're going to pay for five. I'm staying. So I added Spanish as a second major and then turned that into a scholarship to go to the University of Andes in Bogota, Colombia and became fluent. And came back, and that was another avenue. I was offered a full-time job by Wachovia to translate. I was translating part-time with them when I met you, Larry. So it's like I could have moved on and been a translator for, for Wachovia. That's just another area. And I, and I was awful at Spanish. But, man, you immerse yourself in an uncomfortable situation. I live with a Colombian family uh, in Bogota, Colombia. And we're down there, and I mean, they, I took 10 years of Spanish my whole life, and I, I, they were speaking a brand of Spanish I wasn't familiar with. They were going so fast. But by three or four months, when I came back, I actually I got mad at the counter in Miami because they canceled my flight on the way back home after six months. And I had to remember how to say all the words to tell the guy how irritated I was in English. That's how long I'd been down there speaking Spanish. So you can get great at anything. And people say, but how do you do that? It's so hard. Look, for me, I'm a guy It's like, okay, we'll start off with cerveza. That's a beer. Then you're going to need to go to the baño, which is the bathroom. And then you're probably going to want to eat, eat some food, so that's comida. And then you want what kind of food, like carne asada. Well, that's, that's going to be beef. So you figure it out as you go along. And you get around people, put yourself a lot of times in uncomfortable situations, but that's how you grow. Like you said, the sand and the pearl or the clam, whatever. That's, that's where the pearl comes from, the sand and the oyster. Yeah, and uh, the thing about it, I never saw anybody uh have the strength to throw a 30 at the time 35 cent little pressure packed bag of peanuts against the wall and make it explode like you did <laughs> absolutely i think we were all stunned <laughs> but uh yeah i just wanted to give you a little encouragement because you know that the numbers weren't coming in but i knew you were working hard so Want to give you a well, I was so broke, Larry. I was so broke, Larry. I had to eat the peanuts. <laughs> Save a few for the for Debbie at home. And uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's amazing how high you you know the achievement you had in you did taste ultimate achievement in two things in high school. You know, the two things you were, you can be interested in more than one thing, by the way. You know, this whole thing, you got to focus on only one thing. Uh, that idea of reaching that high level, I mean, you had that in your mind. You had that confidence that, you know, going forward, uh, there's something about achieving things that gives you a rock solid confidence. And no matter what you might be facing at the moment, uh, you've got it in your you got it back in the back of your mind that, you know, I, I th it's kind of like Michael Jordan hitting the winning shot, winning the championship at North Carolina, the NCAA championship. He did as a freshman. He said, the rest of my life, when I was in those moments, I'd think back like, I can hit this. I've done it. And, uh, you know, you 
with that reaching. What was the level of, in music and 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 football? All state, all state, or all whatever. Yeah, all all county, all metropolitan in the D.C. area. Yeah, and then uh, music, grade six music is the hardest music you can play. It's uh, our feature piece in that uh, concert at in Chicago was. El Salon, Mexico, by by Aaron Copeland. I mean, it's it's a beast. Anybody knows music knows that piece. They're like, wow, you guys were 15, 16, 17 years old playing that. It's like, yeah, we were. Well, you practiced enough, you can play that too. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, you carry that. You've carried that forward with you, and that set the stage for some even. Uh, you know, you get in that real world. You get in the right position though you start having success and if you've planted yourself in the right spot the right industry uh the right situation the sky can be the limit because those principles never stop working you know that's why it's so important to teach kids the principles that never stop working (laughs) these things always work and no matter what kind of meteor falls out of the sky on your head like john addison uh used to say uh, you know, you can dig your way out and still keep on trucking, you know, and it's those principles that allow you to survive a meteor falling out of the sky on your head. So anyway, Andy, thanks so much. Uh, this has just been a great uh, uh, chance to get to know uh, the early stage. And, you know, if we're fortunate, we'll get back and we can take this and see how you took this kind of thinking and approach to life and uh, went into the business world, you know, evaluating the options and putting things together there and how it's compounded for you, you know. So, uh, anyway, thanks so much, Andy. All right, great to be on. Appreciate it, Larry. Thanks for listening to this episode of Million Dollar Mastermind with me, Larry Wydell. If I've helped you in any way, leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. For more information like this, listen to our other Million Dollar Mastermind episodes and check out my Wydell Academy YouTube channel and visit us on WydellOnWinning.com. I'm the Million Dollar Mastermind, and until next time, go, go, go.